Hi, in this video we're going to discuss how pi bonds can react as electrophiles. First we're going to start with a couple of definitions. A nucleophile is an electron-rich atom that has a negative charge or a delta negative charge and is capable of donating a pair of electrons and it will donate that pair of electrons to an atom other than hydrogen. So there are some examples of nucleophiles down below. You can see ethoxide, so they are those lone pairs of electrons are nucleophilic. They can act as nucleophiles. Notice this species has a negative charge. Ethanol, though, can also act as a nucleophile. It has lone pairs of electrons that it can donate, even though it is neutral. This species that has a carbon bonded to a metal can also act as a nucleophile. Now, although the delta negative might not immediately be obvious, the metal has a delta positive, making the carbon more delta negative. So it's the bond between the two that is nucleophilic and can donate its electrons to another atom. Sometimes it's easier to rewrite that, dissociating the metal and the nonmetal. And there we can see the red lone pair of electrons on the carbon. So it's the carbon really that's nucleophilic. We can do the same thing with other metal species, so organolithium species are also quite common, and where those red electrons between the two, the metal, non-metal, are really attributed more to the like, more electronegative carbon. The lithium acts as a spectator ion. Pi bonds can also act as nucleophiles. In this case, the pi bond, with its overlapping p orbitals that have created the pi molecular orbital, are a site of higher electron density, so they can also be nucleophilic. Electrophiles which will have a positive or delta positive charge are electron deficient atoms and they are capable of accepting a pair of electrons. So a nucleophile will react with an electrophile to form a new bond. And again some examples are shown down here below. So for example electronegative chlorine, electropositive carbon. It's the carbon that is electrophilic. It can act as an electrophile. The carbon in this carbocation is also electrophilic. Notice that it has a full positive charge. Pi bonds can also act as electrophiles. Notice that the resonance structure shows us the positive and negative charge. The hybrid will tell us that there's a delta positive on the bottom carbon and a delta minus on the oxygen. That delta positive is also created by an inductive effect. So the carbon of any carbonyl, be it aldehyde, ketone, ester, amide, etc., that carbon will be electrophilic. From an orbital perspective, it's important to know that, orbit, uh, that electrophiles have an empty orbital. In the carbocation, the empty orbital is an empty p orbital, and it is capable of accepting electrons. Remember that orbitals can have a maximum of two electrons each. On the carbonyl, what we're looking at here is the pi star orbital. And the pi star orbital is empty, and so it's the orbital capable of accepting electrons. We can see how two methyl groups can be either electrophilic or nucleophilic depending on what they're bound to. So in this case, the carbon bound to the chlorine, because the chlorine is pulling electron density away from the carbon, this carbon is electron deficient, so it's electrophilic. In this case, the lithium is more electropositive, the carbon is more electronegative, so this carbon atom is electron rich, so it's nucleophilic. And we can see that reflected in the electrostatic potential maps, which show where the electron density is located on the molecule. Red meaning highest electron density. Notice in the nucleophilic carbon, there's most electron density near the carbon. Whereas in the uh, chloromethane, most of the electron density is on the chlorine. Least amount of electron density is found on the carbon. So in this section, we're going to be studying pi bonds as electrophiles, and we're going to be concentrating on aldehydes, shown on the left, and ketones on the right. In the second year organic course, we'll also be looking at carbonyl groups as part of acid chlorides, acid anhydrides, esters, and amides. Now we see aldehydes, ketones, and other carbonyl groups acting as electrophiles in a number of different compounds. So here are four different ones here, vanillin, cinnamaldehyde, carvone, and benzaldehyde. We also find electrophilic carbonyl species in, in, in steroids, such as progesterone and testosterone. And there are electrophilic carbonyl groups in proteins. So proteins have this repeating amide subunit with R group substituents that can vary. And so that carbon of the carbonyl, the amide carbon, is electrophilic. So the way that nucleophiles react with electrophiles is very similar to the way that acid-base reactions work. Sites of negative charge 
delta negative will be attracted to sites of positive charge or delta positive. And so the reaction that we're going to be repeating through this section is nucleophile with its lone pair of electrons attracted to delta positive because carbon can have a maximum of four bonds. As this bond starts to form, the pi bond between the carbon and oxygen breaks and the more electronegative oxygen gets the electrons. So what we've done is formed a new bond between the nucleophile and the carbon and oxygen has an extra lone pair of electrons and so now it has a negative charge. Because the carbonyl groups are sp2 hybridized, the carbon and the oxygen are both sp2 hybridized, making the center trigonal planar, the nucleophile can react either at the top face of the molecule or it can react at the bottom face of the molecule. So when it reacts at the bottom face of the molecule, we end up with the same type of product only with a different configuration about a given stereocenter. And that difference would be observable if these two R groups were different. So say we had R and R prime, meaning two different groups. We would be able to tell the difference between these two molecules. In this particular case, with one stereocenter, they would be enantiomers. So to look at the full mechanism, we start with a nucleophile, attract to the electrophile, so a new bond between nucleophile and carbon, pi bond goes up to the oxygen. That gives us what's known as a tetrahedral intermediate because of the sp3 hybridized carbon center. We won't stop the reaction when there's a charge on this species, so this is known as an intermediate, and it will be protonated either by water, another alcohol, even acid, and so that acid-base reaction gives us the neutral final product. In this section, we're going to be studying aldehydes and ketones as the electrophiles. And there are a number of different nucleophiles that could be used. We can have oxygen-based nucleophiles, and they might be neutral or charged. We can have sulfur nucleophiles, neutral or charged. Nitrogen nucleophiles, neutral or charged. Hydrogen nucleophiles, which are called hydride because they come hydrogen with a pair of electrons and also carbon-based nucleophiles. So we can have an R group attached to MGBR, and this type of nucleophile is known as a Grignard reagent, named after the chemist who discovered that these could be used as nucleophiles. Cyanide can act as a nucleophile, and it's the carbon that's most nucleophilic. This is known as a Wittig reagent, another nucleophilic carbon. This is a reaction that we will study in detail in second year. RLI, this is known as an organolithium reagent, and we've already mentioned those last two up above. So let's look at a specific example. First, the Grignard reaction. So methyl magnesium bromide, this is the Grignard reagent. Notice that there are two numbers on the arrow. These numbers indicate that these reactions are happening separately. So first we're going to do everything between the substrate, this electrophile, and the nucleophile in step one. There is no water present at this point. Once that first reaction is complete, in a second step, water is added to give us the final product. So as a starting point, we're going to rewrite the methyl magnesium bromide in its ionic form. And that helps us to see that the methyl group is the nucleophile. It has a negative charge and a lone pair of electrons that it can donate. This carbonyl group acts as the electrophile. It has a delta positive carbon, and so the nucleophile is going to be attracted to the electrophile, which forces a lone pair of electrons up onto the oxygen. So notice that we now have a new bond between carbon and carbon, and also a negative charge on the oxygen. That's the end of step one. Now for step two, water is added. And now we're going to have an acid-base reaction. Again, negative attracted to positive. So the negatively charged oxygen electrons will be attracted towards the delta positive hydrogen. And the oxygen takes the electrons from the OH bond. And that's what gives us the final product and hydroxide as. Sodium borohydride reduction works exactly the same way. So an oxidation is defined as a reaction that gives more bonds to more electronegative atoms, such as oxygen. A reduction is the opposite, so fewer bonds to electronegative atoms. So in this case, the central carbon currently has two bonds to an oxygen. In the final product, it will only have one bond to an oxygen. So the carbon will be reduced. 
The first step here is to draw out the reagent in step number one, sodium borohydride. Notice that there's a minus one charge on the boron. It can have a maximum of eight electrons, so the net sodium is not directly bound to it. This is an ionic bond. Because hydrogen is more electronegative than boron, it's the hydrogen that has the excess of electrons in this case, and it's called a hydride because the hydrogen is associated with the pair of electrons between the boron and the hydrogen, so hydride. So the borohydride is the nucleophile. It will be attracted towards the delta plus carbon of the electrophilic species. And so as this new bond forms, these red electrons are going to leave the boron, stay with the hydrogen, and form a new hydrogen-carbon bond. As that bond forms, the oxygen will take the pi electrons. And so that's the end of the first step of the reaction. As soon as all the molecules in the solution have been converted into this product, we then do the second step of the reaction, which is to add aqueous acid. So that might be very commonly uh, hydrochloric acid dissolved in water, for example. So acid-base reaction, electrons attract towards the proton, H-oxygen bond breaks. That equilibrium lies to the product side. And so in the end, we finish with an alcohol. So overall, this carbonyl Carbon has been reduced. It had two bonds to oxygen. In the product, it only has one bond to oxygen. In order to make a new bond, it's, imp it's imperative that a filled orbital overlap with an empty orbital, and that forms a new bond, or a new molecular orbital. There's a maximum, recall, of two electrons per orbital. So two filled orbitals, with their two electrons each, they cannot overlap together, or that would give an orbital with four electrons, which is impossible. So the way this works is that a filled orbital, the filled orbital that reacts is the highest energy occupied molecular orbital. So it's an occupied molecular orbital or an orbital that has two electrons that's the highest in energy in the nucleophile. The empty orbital that re reacts is from the electrophile and it has the lowest energy. So it's known as the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So the nucleophilic orbital is called the HOMO. The electrophilic orbital is called the LUMO. So let's bring this back to the case that we have with the double bond. Remember that to make a double bond, we have two p orbitals from the starting atoms, and they overlap in phase to form a pi molecular orbital. So it's not two discrete p orbitals that are present in a pi bond, it's a single pi molecular orbital. Now if those orbitals overlapped out of phase, we would get an antibonding molecular orbital. Because it's the pi molecular orbital that's lower in energy, it's the one that's filled with electrons. And the sigma star, or the antibonding molecular orbital, is empty. So because it's the double bond that's acting as the electrophile in this case, the electrophile is going to use the unoccupied molecular orbital to form the new bond. So we're going to look at the orbitals involved in this specific example. So we have the ketone electrophile, the cyanide nucleophile. So the cyanide is attracted towards the delta plus, forces the pi electrons onto the oxygen. In a second step, there's the tetrahedral intermediate. It will be protonated, and the, this type of product is known as a cyanohydrin. Let's look first at an animation of this mechanism. So there's the cyanide attracted towards the delta plus carbonyl. Electrons at the same time from the pi bond going up onto the oxygen. And that gives us the first intermediate, but it's higher energy because the oxygen has a negative charge, so we're going to go through a second transition state to get to a more stable final product. Here comes the acid. The acid reacts with the lone pair to form a new bond. And there's the conjugate base. And now we've achieved the final product, which is the lowest energy species. Let's look at that from an orbital point of view. So here's the nucleophile, in this case the cyanide, coming towards the electrophile. They cannot react as is because a filled orbital cannot react with another filled orbital. So instead, the filled orbital will react with the empty pi star orbital. This angle shows you that the angle that is required, known as the bergy dunitz angle, to get the best overlap between these two orbitals and to get the best bond formation possible. 
So a filled or homo from the nucleophile will react with the lumo from the electrophile. And they overlap, and as they do so, they form a new bond. Notice the hybridization of this carbon has changed from sp3 to sp2 during the reaction. In the last step, and don't worry about which lone pair is chosen, but in the last step, electrons from the oxygen will take the proton in order to give us the neutral final product. So there's the final proton transfer. So in summary, we've looked at the definition of a nucleophile, which is an electron donor that is negatively charged or has a delta negative. An electrophile is an electron deficient species that has a positive charge or a partial positive charge. In this first set of reactions that we're going to see, the nucleophile will react with a ketone or aldehyde electrophile, forming a new nucleophile carbon bond, giving a lone pair of electrons to the oxygen. To do so, a filled orbital, called the HOMO, overlaps with an empty orbital, known as the LUMO. That tetrahedral intermediate will be protonated in order to become neutral via an acid-base reaction.